this is the defining moment of the Bearcat program, this matchup. And so if you're Alabama, you're taking the Bearcats seriously. But at the same time, you're like, well, we don't have to play Georgia right away. We don't have to play this dangerous Michigan team. Cincinnati's not a power, quote unquote, conference team. And so, I don't know. I, I really like the experience of Cincinnati to give Alabama a lot of trouble. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Today we have a digital sports media veteran and host of The Solid Verbal, Dan Rubenstein. Dan, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. What, what an honor it is. We're, we're, I'm on the West Coast briefly. You guys are spread around the country. We're talking college football, maybe food. What's better than yes, that? Sir. Oh, yeah, we, we oh excuse me. <laughs> we will talk food. I'm ready. 100%. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Done. Absolutely. But first, we want to talk a little college football playoff. And uh, we heard you have some some strong opinions about, you know, the playoffs. Let's start with the um, the Cotton Bowl, Alabama against Cincinnati. Uh, what do you got for us about that game? I can't wait. I actually I like Cincinnati. I don't know if Cincinnati wins. I don't know what the spread is. I don't know if that even matters. But Cincinnati is one of those teams to me with time to game plan with i still have questions about alabama up front on offense we saw them struggle against lsu with some blitz packages we saw them struggle with auburn's front auburn oh yeah cincinnati is absolutely one of the best teams at both rushing the passer my jay sanders is a dangerous dangerous gentleman and then sauce gardner i mean we're talking about a fast experienced angry violent cincinnati defense and I, I like Bryce Young a ton. Obviously, so do the fine people at the Heisman. <laughs> but look, th- we're dealing with an Alabama team who has not run the ball like they have in previous years. I like Brian Robinson. And in terms of the weaponry, like Jamison Williams is fantastic. John Mechie's hurt. They don't they just don't go as deep with experienced uh danger to me at receiver. So I like Cincinnati to re- like this is this is the defining moment of the Bearcat program, this matchup. And so if you're Alabama, you're taking the Bearcats seriously. But at the same time, you're like, well, we, we got the lucky end of the straw. That's not a phrase. We got, you know, we didn't get, <laughs> we don't have to play Georgia right away. We don't have to play this dangerous Michigan team. Cincinnati's not a power, quote unquote, conference team. And so, I don't know. I, I really like the experience of Cincinnati to give Alabama a lot of trouble. Okay, so here's all I'll say. First of all, uh, at least as of this recording, the spread is 13 and a half points. It's a lot. A lot of now, it's a lot of points. As a matter a of fact, I, I could be wrong about this. I think it's the most points ever for one of these playoff games, the biggest spread ever. And you can understand why. Now, listen, if you look at the statistics, Dan, you know, they're comparable in terms of their rankings. I think defense, they're seventh and eighth. But it, here's my issue, okay? Look at their schedules. Alabama in the first, I want to say, they played three top 15 teams in the first five weeks. Now, granted, one of them was Florida, who really wasn't a top 15 team by the end of the season, by the middle of the season, by the way. But Cincinnati has played one top 15 team all year long. They did a great job. You know, they beat Notre Dame decisively at Notre Dame. But... I don't know that there's really any comparison you can make. This is kind of like a blind look, don't you think? Yeah, no, it's definitely a blind look. Though we do have the data point that Cincinnati gave Georgia all it could handle last year in that bowl game. They lose close. And Cincinnati, other than, look, they it, they very well could have lost to Tulsa. Let's be real. Um, and, and the Navy game wasn't pretty. But otherwise, they win all their game by du- double digits. They take care of a strong Houston defense in the conference championship game and, and win that one going well away. So if you do like Cincinnati and if you do expect things of the Bearcats because they don't play in the strongest conference, they, they were kind of decisive. Now, they kind of slept walk through October, but they turned it on the last few games of the season and... I don't know. There is there is something about having, you know, Desmond Ritter's talked about in NFL conversations, right? Luke Fickle, everybody wants him that has a job opening. So we're talking about, you know, Jerome Ford is a, a transfer from Alabama and hitting home runs at running back. So what are we actually talking about with Cincinnati? It, it's basically that they were a power conference team until realignment kind of left them out. They won 10 plus games with, you know, Brian Kelly and Butch Davis, whoever, when they were in a power conference. 
And then they just keep winning and keep beating whoever's in front of them, including Notre Dame. I get what you're saying, that it's kind of a crapshoot, that like, okay, who have they played? But they've taken care of business against the best teams that they've played, which I, I think is all you can ask for. That's a good point. And I, I would like to ask you a question about motivation. You know, one of the things that we always talk about when we talk about Nick Saban is Nick Saban's quote about rat poison, rat poison right? Yeah. The rat poison. So <laughs> he needs the rat poison so his guys can get up for this game because it's hard to sustain that level of excellence week in and week out. Where's the rat poison when it comes to playing Cincinnati? Like, how do you get your team ready for this group of five team? Like, that's what, you know, and Cincinnati is going to be overly motivated to go out there and make a statement. But I don't see that necessarily from Alabama. So play, talk about the, the, the factor that motivation plays in this Cotton Bowl game. It's a great question. And it's one of those situations where it's sort of lose-lose. Like you beat Cincinnati. You should have beaten Cincinnati. You lose right, to Cincinnati. Right. How could you lose to Cincinnati? And so <laughs> exactly. I That's told, your rat poison right there. Right, exactly. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the motivation is basically you're in the playoff. You are playing for your – But they're your, always in the playoff. They're always you in the playoff. I mean? Right. You're on this huge stage like you always yeah. are. And yeah. I guess the rat poison is that you don't want to be embarrassed and that you want to show out on the biggest possible stage and you want to get the, – the problem to me, the actual rat poison, is even if you look ahead, why does Alabama have to beat Georgia twice? What is it that Alabama didn't prove if Georgia wins on the other side <laughs> against Georgia? Like, I'm not saying Georgia shouldn't necessarily be in the playoff, but I'm also kind of saying, like, We've kind of seen it. Like what Georgia had a shot, and I don't know the team that should be Wait, in place. Don't yeah. you know who you're talking to? You're talking to a guy from Michigan. Okay, I'm, I'm so who's figuring? Go ahead and finish first. I was going to say. Finish. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> I'd like the, to the say. guy. Your number twenty one is thinking that they, that's not going to be an issue because they're not going to sure. be playing Georgia. Right. I that's hear not, you. That's not my. That's not my brother back there in that picture. No. I don't know if you can see it. But. <laughs> Let me, let me tell you where my wife went to college. Let me uh. tell you, I am in a amazing blue family, so I'm watching my words. Um, so the thing is, I, I, I got off on a tangent. The actual rat poison is very real, and I think that's a factor in Cincinnati's favor because they're playing with nothing to lose. They've already, they've already won. They've already gotten here, and this is all gravy right now for the Bearcats. So basically what you're relying on is Nick Saban, Bill O'Brien, uh, Pete Gold Golding, and the rest of the coaches saying, like, look, you're prepared. This is, this is the easy part. You're practicing against better players, so just go out and perform. And so – it's on them. It's on, you know, we have Bryce Young who can single-handedly, it seems, beat just about everybody. So as long as the best pass rusher, arguably, all due respect to Aiden Hutchinson, plays relatively close to his ceiling, Alabama should be in a good place to win just because of what they've already shown. All right, let, let's talk matchups because that's always a fun thing to watch. Yeah. You mentioned Jerome Ford. I think he's obviously an elite player, and I think a lot of people are wondering, is he going to be able to run against the Alabama defense? That'll be fun to watch. But the other thing that I'm really interested to see is Ahmad Gardner against Jamison Williams and how that all comes to pass in factoring in uh, Bryce Young. What do you think? I think it's a fantastic matchup, and I'm curious to see what Alabama does if Jamison Williams is merely good and not transcendent. And I don't think Jamison Williams is where Devontae Smith was last year, but in terms of a home run threat, in terms of what what he can do I, I really like the phrase there's a, an nba writer talking about steph curry and gravitational players right that you have to know where a player is on the basketball court you have to know where certain receivers are on the field which is actually an issue on the with if you flip the the matchups and you look at where cincinnati is at receiver which is not near where alabama is but no i, I think that's going to be fascinating because what alabama doesn't have with john mechie out is that second guy and they rely on tight ends you know slate bolden is, is a little bit underneath but who is it from Alabama? And maybe it's one of those young dudes that steps up. We saw it at the end of the Auburn game. But who is that that second gravitational threat if Jamison Williams is not neutralized but not going for 185? No, I, I think it's a fascinating matchup. Don't forget they have, uh, what was it, Kobe Bryant on the other side too who mm -hmm. won the Jim Thorpe Award too. So yep. Cincinnati got two really solid cornerbacks. And I don't think they're – I'm curious to see how they play 
uh, Jameson, because they don't really flip. Like I mean, they, well, they just one's a boundary corner and one plays the field. So I don't see one guy following Jameson the whole game. But who knows? They may f- switch it up. I don't think that's in their DNA to do that. I think they have a lot of confidence in both cornerbacks and in both cornerbacks matching up with any receiver on Alabama's offense. But you're right. Without Jameson, hey, I mean, without Mechie, James is that one deep threat. One quick question, and you may not be able to answer this. How does Ryan Day let Jameson get out of Columbus? How does that even happen? Now, listen, I know the people around college football, they say that uh, Ohio State has the best receiving meeting room in college football and FBS. I get all of that. But they ain't got no Jameson in that meeting room. I mean, how does he escape from Columbus? I don't. Not enough NIL money. I get, yeah, it's. <laughs> we have to find it because that dude. Where's he, he from? Do I don't have it in front of me. Where's Jamison Williams from? I don't know if it was a geographic thing getting closer to home. I don't know if he's from Texas or something where Ohio State is recruited well. Let's see. We can look that hey, up. Hey, I tell you what, Dan, I, I've seen um, families from from Hawaii. I've sure. seen families from California. I've seen families from all over move to the city yeah. where their son is playing. So if that was an issue, I don't think they would have had a problem moving Jameson's people to some area around Columbus. He's from Missouri, I think. Okay, he's from Missouri. So I don't know if he was wanted to be a little bit closer to home. I don't know if he didn't get along with people. I don't know. Look, Ohio is, is a different place, and Desmond can you know, testify to that. Maybe he, he just didn't love Columbus. But, yeah, you're not wrong. And, yeah, that that, figure re- it out, man. that receiver room, look, how does Ohio State let Joe Burrow go? And it was just – it was dumb luck where he got hurt every single time he was competing, and Ohio State had good dudes that, that were starting. It was, you know, JT Barrett and Dwayne Haskins. But it's one of those things that when you have that embarrassment of riches – how, how do you know? How do you know until you actually see them on the field, whether or not they're picking up the offense or not? And the fact is, look, look at what Ohio State's number three receiver did this year. I think it was against Nebraska. Jackson Smith and Jigwa goes for like, I don't know, 280 or whatever he did. So yeah, yeah. what are they going to yeah. let Jackson Smith and Jigwa but go? Like, out what athlete doing? Nebraska, though. I That's mean, this true. dude is doing it in the SEC. I mean, he, he's a I – mean, I don't know. To me, he's like such a special talent. Like, yeah. you just don't let this one get away. He can do things that – None of those three can do. And he's big. Not wrong. And he's yeah, big. So anyway, anyway. All right. Just, just right. not ask that yeah. question. No, <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right. So now now listen. Everybody buckle their seatbelts. Okay. okay. Georgia and Michigan. Are you are you ready for this? The both of you have got dogs in this fight, obviously. <laughs> Georgia's the eight and a half point favorite. And the thing about this game, obviously, these teams are much more closely matched, you would imagine, mm-hmm. than you know. Uh, than Cincinnati, Cincinnati, excuse me, in Alabama. But one of the things that I love about college football, one of the things I love about college sports is teams playing against one another that don't often play against one another. Sure. And these are two of the titans of the game in terms of programs. And these programs haven't met in 56 years. And, and I just think for me, I, I mean, I know that there isn't anything about that that impacts you know the game itself other than the romance of it. And I love that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a fantastic element to this matchup that you have these these blue blood programs that haven't met, that don't have this shared history. It'd be nice if there were, you know, a random huge game from the 90s that ended in a brawl or something like that that we could point to <laughs> as a narrative. But look, we're rewriting history and it's great. Um, no, I, I think it's fantastic. It, it's a matchup. Look, on my show, I made the case for Michigan winning this game. So let's be clear that... I, I, I don't have a dog in this fight other than my wife becomes violent during Michigan games. <laughs> so I'd like for her to be happy. I'd like for my in-laws to be happy. I'd like for all of that kind of stuff. But no, so this is a great matchup. Like, I, I don't know if, where you want to dive in first with this one, but I absolutely can't wait just because we, we don't have any data points on a history between these two teams. All right, so let me just give you, let me just give you one quick data point. Sure. Here. Let me jump in here. with, And this is a crazy statistic. During the regular season, Georgia allowed less than a third of a point per drive. Yeah. Now, you could argue that, well, so what? Did you see the Alabama game? Um, But this is, uh, you know, potentially a historically good defense, but so too is Michigan. What's the difference here? Uh, Depth. The waves that Georgia can come at teams, the waves that, that the number threes, the three, the, the third best outside or the third string outside linebacker or the third string safety for Georgia 
is light years better than what Michigan has, which is not anything against Michigan because they're light years ahead of 127 teams with how they've recruited. And so what, you know, Dan Lanning, now the new Oregon coach, who I have a skin in that game as a, as a Duck alumni, um, what he's able to do is just keep guys fresh. And so that's such a big difference. That is the secret sauce with college football is who has the best number two, who has the best number three, whereas Michigan has ones that can compete with anybody like Dax Hill coming downhill from the safety position can make plays as well as any sort of hybrid type safety as anybody in the country. But the difference is if he gets hurt, if a linebacker gets hurt, if a nose tackle gets hurt or whatever, what's the drop off like? With Georgia, and as you alluded to with the the points per drive stat, the reason that is what it is is there are fresh legs in that game for four quarters. And so what you can do against Georgia's defense is have the best quarterback in the country with one of the like two or three best receivers in the country with Bryce Young and Jamison Williams or find a way to keep their pass rush at bay at least a little bit because if there is a weaker point to this Georgia defense and that's sort of like a quote-unquote weaker point it's that they replace both of their corners coming into the season and the safeties are experienced the corners are a little bit greener and we saw at times you know Kentucky drove the ball a little bit it's all relative to Georgia's success but no it, it the, the real difference is that behind N'Kobe Dean behind Jordan Davis is another guy who's 91% as good. And Michigan just doesn't have that element, which, again, basically nobody does. Yeah, i tell you what. Watching the SEC championship game, I thought that Georgia's defensive front seven would dominate yeah. um, Alabama's you know offensive line. And it was quite the opposite. It, what what was it that, that Bill O'Brien saw that he was able to do to keep that front seven at bay? Because it's not like uh, Bryce Young was out there throwing a bunch of hitches and slants and no. bubble screens. I mean, um, shoot, Jamison was getting deep and he was getting downfield. I, I remember one play where Bryce threw a touchdown to Mechie and he was pretty much back there in the pocket directing traffic. Like he was so calm and collected because no one was around him. How did they keep that you know front seven at bay uh, for four quarters it's an amazing question I think basically every Alabama fan is as surprised as we all are <laughs> looking at what how the offensive line performed if you look at some of the cut-ups I've, I've only seen some but it, it, they bring in a backup center they're beat up at center he performs really well and so maybe it's him seeing and making calls and checks you know with what the Georgia front was trying to do but if you look at the twists and stunts that Georgia was trying to get home with Alabama was there. Alabama was prepared. So I think you credit Doug Marone with getting this unit prepared after a couple of, of pretty down weeks and performances against LSU and Auburn. And ultimately, that gives Bryce Young the time to make those plays. Well, I, let's, let's flip the script, though. Yeah. How about Michigan's front seven against Georgia's offensive line? What do you see there? I think Michigan's going to do well. I, I think Aiden Hutchinson's going to do well, and it's one of those things where if he gets more attention, if he's getting chips or whatever off the edge – then the interior of that Michigan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you Ojabo's going to get a little free if he's not getting the attention. You know, whether it's a guy like Donovan Jeter inside making more plays yeah. because more attention is happening. I think Georgia's offensive line is very good. And one of the interesting things about Georgia is they're not an explosive team. Now, maybe they will be more so with a healthier George Pickens. But, you know, leading receivers, they're tight, a freshman tight end who's very good in Bryce Bowers. And their running backs, while they're efficient, these are not, it's not Sony Michelle, it's not DeAndre Swift. These are guys are getting seven, 12 yards, but they're not changing fields with their ability. So I think if Michigan can tackle, if Michigan can force third and eights, third and sevens, and I think Stetson Bennett is, is, a, is a really good quarterback who's probably a little bit too maligned because of his performances against Alabama. <laughs> yeah. But if Michigan can force those moments, and Michigan's one of the best teams at forcing three and outs in, in the country, the Michigan has a really good shot. Now, I, I really do think it's going to come down to tackling. It's what does that first guy do, you know, against a ball carrier, against a tight end? If he's making a tackle, I think Michigan's in good shape. If if the Georgia running backs especially are breaking those tackles, Amir White and James, uh, Amir White and James Cook are breaking those tackles, that's a problem. That's a huge problem because that's that's the Georgia game. Haskins and Corum uh, able to run and be effective in this game against that defensive line? I think largely no, but Michigan has done a really good job of being creative and getting those guys in space. We saw, what, Donovan Edwards a couple weeks ago. 
you know, being used all over the field. There have been guys who have stepped up. Blake Corum as a receiver out of the backfield. I think the key is just how do you lighten the, the Georgia box? How do you, you know, use those running backs creatively in the passing game to lighten up the box? And so you wear Georgia down a little bit. And if you can pick up those third and shorts and keep the Georgia defense on the field, I think those guys can be effective. But I don't think we're going to see Michigan dominate like they did against Iowa, like they did against Ohio State, like they did pretty much all along the back half of the the the, uh, the schedule. So, no, I think they're going to be fine situationally. I just don't think the Michigan running game is going to dictate what happens in this game. All right, so if the Michigan running game isn't going to dictate what's going to happen, what about Kate McNamara? No picks. That's all it is, right? It's <laughs> that if he doesn't throw, you know, uh, an interception like he did against Ohio State when he threw into triple coverage, one of those passes, they're not going to rely on Cade McNamara to win this game. And it really does hurt Michigan. I think ultimately that uh, that Ronnie Bell is hurt and, you know, he was sort of that safety valve. But they've found guys and it's just going to be what does Cade McNamara look like on third and eight? Is he throwing in rhythm? Because he is going to have to, on a certain level, win this game. And it's not winning this game by throwing for 400 yards, but what does he do on third down? What does he do when he does have that opportunity? Because they're going to be you know, few and far between against this Georgia defense. It's just not making that killer mistake. Like, he, you know, like he's done a couple of times, but ultimately, Michigan's in the playoff with, I would say, probably average quarterback play, which I think is a testament to how they're coached, how the, how they've schemed teams, and how well that offensive line is played. I think Josh Gaddis has done a tremendous job yeah. of scheming teams, and that's the thing that people, I don't think, uh, understand. Like, he was the uh, assistant coach of the year. Um, he the won Broyles. that award. Yeah, yeah the, the Broyles, Broyles Award, award for assistant coach for the year. So it's because of how he's able to scheme. And they're not going to just line up and, you know, slam it in between the tackles against against Georgia's defense, just like they didn't do that against uh, Iowa in the, in the Big Ten Conference Championship game. You know, so he's going to use these guys in ways that, you know, the, the, to try to loosen up that box, like you said, and then attack the box. And, you know, when you're going to pick and choose when he attacks the box. But I, I do like the fact you brought up Ronnie Bell because people don't understand, like, Michigan at the beginning of the season lost their best offensive weapon. And they've been able to do this without their best offensive weapon. And a lot of teams wouldn't have been able to, you know, pull this off, losing their best guy like that. So that's a great point. And some of the younger receivers have stepped up. But, again, Josh Gass has put those guys in position to succeed. So it's, it's going to be an interesting matchup to see what they do. Now, you mentioned George Pickens. The concern with Pickens is obviously he missed most of the season with ACL, came back against Georgia Tech, played a couple snaps, came back in the SEC championship game against Alabama, played some snaps, didn't quite look like himself. And then I believe he caught COVID during this right. break. Well, it so was there's he, there's weird up in the air. Like he tested positive, and the next day yeah. he tested negative, and so and we saw there's what, a Jason, lot of that going around. Right? Yeah, literally, and yeah. Uh, so it's, I'm not sure if he met, if he missed any time is, is is what I'm. I don't know if he missed time. No, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't heard the latest. How, how do they handle that? Because you know this is a time where people are um, using to get the players healthy. You get great reps and mm -hmm. you get healthy. You talked about Dax Hill. Dax Hill was actually in and out of that Ohio State game, right? With an, with an injury, and now this is a chance to get him healthy too. And uh, Blake Corum obviously had the high ankle sprain, uh, and now he's you know chance to get him healthy too. So it's going to be interesting to see how these guys um, come back now. So, healthy. so what, are what are your keys? What are your keys? You're you're invested. I mean, emotionally Me? invested. What are what are your keys? Um, well, like I if you're gonna Michigan, map out map Michigan, out a Michigan win, Michigan and Cincinnati, they're both playing with house money right now. True. Like they're playing with house money. Michigan's playing with house money right now. Um, I think that the matchup is up front in the trenches, like you like you um, talked about. I don't think there's no surprise. Uh, it's gonna be you know uh, you know both both ways. It's not just. Georgia's front seven against Michigan's offensive line is also going to be Michigan's front seven against Georgia's offensive line. And the thing about Georgia, and you, you know this damn better than anybody, like they're kind of built like a Big Ten team. You know, they, they were getting 12 personnel, maybe 13. You know, they're not going to spread you out with three or four wide outs and attack you like, you know, Ole Miss or Mississippi State. That's not their style. Like you said, they want to establish the line of scrimmage. They want to run the ball, and they're going to use their tight end. Kind of sounds like maybe a Wisconsin, kind of like an Iowa. So this isn't, yeah. So I think the matchup as far as schematically and what Michigan has been able to see throughout the season, it matches up pretty well with their defense and what they're used to. Um, the thing is, Michigan's offense is so multiple 
that is hard. You know, they can bring in J.J. McCarthy. Now you got a dual threat quarterback who can actually sling it too. So now your defense got to do something on the back end because are we going to come up because he's a dual threat? He may run the, the read option or he may throw it over your head. You could bring in Donovan Edwards. He's a great receiver out of the backfield. Oh, yeah, guess what? In the Big Ten Championship game, he did a double pass for a touchdown. That's true. So there's just so much to me that you have to prepare for when you, you know, defensively when you're trying to defend this Michigan offense. Yeah, you're right. It, the, the thing that scares me about the Michigan offense is the, the, the moments where they really slowed down. And it was largely earlier on in the season, like the second half against Rutgers, things like that. And, you know, you get over it. You improve from, from those points. But it's one of those – the thing I, I sort of hate as a neutral observer because I just see it across the sport is let's say Cade McNamara and Michigan are down 20-17 to 17, but really playing well. And J.J. McCarthy just comes in cold in the third quarter. Like, I, I would be terrified of that. And <laughs> I just, I kind of, like, if the, the, the dual quarterback system, especially in these huge spots, like, I get getting him reps. I get that he offers something different. But in a close game, all of a sudden, he's coming in completely arrhythmic. That that scares me. That And it, it happened against Michigan State for the worse. But it's just one of those things where, I, even that situation, I don't put that on him. Like, he doesn't, he's not within the rhythm of a game. And so... That, to me, is a little bit terrifying that Michigan could give away something in this game by bringing him in in a key spot. All right, l let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about some of the bigger picture issues uh, sure. affecting college football and uh, some of the things that Des and I have talked about all year, but uh, also some of the more recent ones. And I was thinking about this this morning. As we sit here recording this episode, three bowl games so far have been canceled. And it got me to thinking, well, what happens – if there's an impact on the two semifinal games and the final games. Now, there is a, a protocol for what would happen um, if one team in the semifinals is affected and can't field enough players, they would forfeit, which is crazy if you think about it, you know, that we've gotten to this point and we're talking about a forfeit. The championship game could be postponed four days, but then if a team can't field enough players, it would be forfeited, and if both teams, and in my understanding, maybe maybe uh, I've got the information wrong, if both teams are unable to field uh, a squad, they would just vacate the title. There would be a blank no title this year. Wow. wow. You know, wow. how worried are you if you are one of these four teams and whomever it is in the program that's in charge of health and safety or, you know, whatever that, whoever that person is on the team, these must be crazy times, don't you think? Yeah, for I them? mean, you're, you're you're trying to control the uncontrollable at this yeah. point. We don't know. It's one of those things where I'm definitely I'm man enough to say I don't know about a lot of things because <laughs> it's one of those things where like, what are you supposed to do if, if kids are going home, if kids are socializing, right? And we we understand that like this specific variant we think, but we don't know, is more transmissible, but less. You know, it, it, it's it's making guys less sick or something like that, and so maybe the recovery time is better. But we don't know. It's it's a wild situation. And, I mean, I proposed that we have, like, the long snappers compete in, like, a physical and academic <laughs> challenge. You know, if we get to the point Skills where competition. A skills – maybe it's the Dr. Pepper throw. I punt, don't pass, know. and kick. It's the punt, pass, and kick, but then there's a spelling bee, a geography <laughs> right. bee, right? Um, no, I don't know what you do, right? You just sort of have to throw up your hands and tell your players, like, hey – be responsible, do as best you can. It's it's really no different than living life. It's just a very specific thing where it's just like, hey, look out for yourself, look out for your loved ones, look out for your teammates, and make responsible decisions. Telling that to 19, 20, 21 year olds is not always going to be the easiest thing in the world, but you know, we're trying to control the uncontrollable. So it's it really is just throwing your hands up and it would be it'd be a huge bummer. I mean the the no contest. Huge bummer. Thing, yeah. A multi, multi million dollar bummer to begin with. It's not my money, though I do like the <laughs> listeners. I do like the listeners on my show who like listening to us talk about college football. But yeah, it, it's it's a huge, huge uh, explosion within the sport. And so I don't know. I it's one of those I just do your best, guys. Come on. Right. Um so I got one other for you here. And, yeah. and again, this is something Des and I have kind of batted back and forth. What's your position on the whole transfer portal thing? Because sure. uh, there are some things that have happened this week, and I'm thinking specifically about this Craig Bowl, the coach at Wyoming, yeah. who basically took to Twitter to say, 
Come on, we need a quarterback. We need your help. Come on in. Look what we did with Josh Allen. It's literally, literally Craigslist with Craig Ball. Yeah, there there you go. Looking for (laughs) a quarterback. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Um, No, I think it's it's definitely a situation the transfer portal where two things can be true at once. I think the first thing is if coaches can move around, if staffers can move around, if directors of recruiting can move around freely within the sport and within different programs, there should be a certain amount of autonomy for players to make decisions that are best for themselves in terms of playing times, in terms of comfort, in terms of the experience with a specific position coach or coordinator or head coach. I, I'm i totally good with that sort of going both ways thing. The, the second thing that I think can be true at once is it's kind of a bummer. And I'll use that word again. It's kind of a bummer because th- it's an impossible sport to follow, right? It's it's one of those things where like, if you're a USC fan or something like that, you watch USC games and you hope that USC wins. But if you're a college football fan, that means you need to know about recruiting. That needs, means you need to know about transfers. That means you need to know about coaches moving all over the place. That means you need to be about teams moving conferences. That means you need to know about teams moving levels, FCS to FBS and beyond. You need to, there's so many like different intricacies to the sport much in the way like european soccer like you can buy a player but then you have to return them like you can't it's an impossible sport to be a casual fan of and if you add the player movement all over the sport we're like okay this guy is now a quarterback of this team up oh, he's transferred again and they're only there for two three four five years at a time and coaches are leaving all the time it's it makes it a more difficult sport to enjoy as a casual fan to say like Oh, I'm watching Arkansas, Mississippi State. I know exactly who the stars of these teams are. That's really difficult with the, the 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 players moving all over the country. I don't have a solution for it. I just think it's one of those things where it's it's a new reality that makes the sport more difficult to uh, to follow if you're a casual fan. You think it's difficult as a casual fan? Try as an analyst. I'm right there <laughs> with you, man. <laughs> I I'm trying to think like there are guys Man, that have played I can't keep up look, with these guys. Think about bro. uh Tate Tate for CA, right? How many schools did he play for? I mean any quarterback named Tate, Tate Martell, right? Like Tate it's Martell just, bounced all the way all right. around. Yeah. And it's just exactly. it, it's one of those things where it's yeah. it's very difficult to say like it, it yes, really I, is. I'm covering <laughs> the sport and it's a 365 day a year sport to just keep track of where did this coordinator go? Where did this, you know, this guy's in the NFL now like it's then like there's a guy on on utah Britton covey who's been there since 2015 and he is a <laughs> godsend because it he went on like a sean clifford up there at Penn State. yes <laughs> yes i mean at least covey went on a, an lds mission which makes it nice at least you know yeah, right, left right, for two right. years and came back but it's also you know it's one of those things where you're just like wait he's still there or like right. wait how long has he been gone and i don't know you got to keep yeah. covering go to go to the college football subreddit and just i don't know live there oh no that yeah. talk about a rabbit hole man yeah. that is true that is right well you listen <laughs> you obviously have a smile on your face because you now have a new quarterback up in uh up at oregon yeah you happy with the bo nix uh the transfer yeah man i don't know i mm. well, there's like there's good bo nix and there's not so good bo nix and true. very I'd, true i'd like to give a quarterback the benefit of the doubt who has had a number of coordinators who has had a couple head coaches and i i think the best of what we saw out of bo nix this year you know i think three of the last four games that Auburn played in, he was really, really strong. It's just a question of he's now has a, a new old offensive coordinator in Kenny Dillingham. He has good receivers at Oregon. He should have a good line, but it's new. It's it's him moving across the country. And so, yeah, I think the best of Bo Nix is a probably a top 15 national quarterback, but we also see him rifling checkdowns incomplete and throwing it above open receivers' heads 11 yards away. And so... Yeah, I, I would love it if if Ty Thompson, the he'll be a second year quarterback next season, if if he were able to step up. He is he has mentioned that he is he is all in on uh on battling for the open quarterback job, but I don't know if Bo Nix transfers to Oregon unless he thinks he's starting. So I, I think the best of him is interesting. I think the Pac twelve is you know, other than essentially Utah right now, with the changes at USC, who Oregon doesn't have this year, uh Oregon has Georgia to open up the season, but otherwise the Pac twelve schedule is kind of amazing if you look at what Oregon's 2021 schedule looks like so I think Bo Nix can be above average and this this team can win the uh win the conference especially if Dan Lanning's able to uh to convince a bunch of dudes to stay well, well can we switch gears Jay Rowe and talk a little bit about food Let's. because I hear I hear that you know we all appreciate the culinary arts and um yeah. I hear that Dan is quite I just foodie. like to eat 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we all like the now, Dan. Let me. I, I know you, 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 man. Vast knowledge of of not only different foods, but different restaurants and different sure. cities. Now, but do you cook at all? Okay, Desmond. I'm about to tell you. I'm about to take you and Jimmy down a wormhole. So I moved. <laughs> I moved from Brooklyn to Chicago. The, the burbs Brooklyn. of Chicago. The northern Chicago burbs. Okay. Uh, in the summer of 2020, and I missed. The, the pizza I was able to have in Brooklyn so terribly. And I, I got tired of complaining about it. So I just said, okay. I'm gonna be the change I wanna see in the world. Okay. And I, <laughs> I bought about $200 worth of equipment, including a steel pan for my oven. And okay. I started fermenting my own dough, experimenting wow. with different flour blends, going to <laughs> restaurant supply stores, experimenting with mozzarellas. Are you serious? And I now, yeah, you know what, I actually, I sent a message to your co-host, Kirk, when you guys were in Chicago, because he okay. had messaged me about, I, I created a vanity Instagram around my pizza that I wow. now, like I have pop-ups with. And <laughs> um, I sent him a message. I didn't hear back from him. And okay. as, cause you guys, I think we're in Chicago for yeah. Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yep. I'll tell you this. So I make a lot of pizza, both like a thinner New York style and uh, like the Detroit pan style with the caramelized cheese crust. Of course, yeah. If either of one of you ever finds yourselves in the northern suburbs of Chicago, okay. at any point, okay. let me know, and I will treat you with pizza like a casino treats a Japanese billionaire. <laughs> I, I will inundate you, and you can take a look. I'll send you guys the link. Take a look. It's Valley yeah. Circle Pizza because that's the okay. street I grew up off of in Southern California. Take a look. If anything looks interesting to you, yeah. let me know. I will take care of you. I'm gonna tell you this. If we do if we do that, Dan, yeah. you have to keep it between the two of us because mm. I have twin boys and little twin. It would be <laughs> it, it it would be blasphemous for me to go to Chicago and eat any type of pizza other than deep dish pizza. I hear you. Like when I when I go to Chicago, anytime I go, mm -hmm. I have to bring home four frozen deep dish yeah. pieces. I'm talking about I'm going to get the styrofoam container. I'm going to get the dry ice. I gotta get the box but like wow. I'm telling you, anytime I go to Chicago. So if we do this, Dan, it has to stay between the That's two fine. of us because he, he, you, he probably wouldn't let me in the front door. You can still bring home the deep dish pies. I'm just no, giving but the you... fact that I'm in Chicago eating anything other than deep dish. I know. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna. What I was gonna to say is, twin. you're a brave man to go to Chicago and complain <laughs> about pizza. I gotta say. I know, right? Let me tell you. I mean, I, and now I'm a new. I'm a New Yorker, so mm -hmm. I don't think there's a discussion to be had myself. Ooh -wee, but ooh you know wee. what? I mean, yeah. I know how people in Chicago <laughs> feel about everything okay that's true yeah. chicago people <laughs> love chicago and god bless them <laughs> it's true. great and i married into a chicago family uh go. i think deep dish is fine uh okay. it's just one of those things that you have to dedicate your day to eating and recovering from <laughs> recovering yeah it's the recovery process it's a buttery it's a richer crust and they also to yeah. be fair chicago also has like the super thin bar style tavern square cut pies so you can mm -hmm. get super thick or super crispy and thin. Like that's a thing that's a, a known uh, a known specialty of Chicago. I just miss what I had in Brooklyn. I really, you know, that, that yeah. was that was a selfish thing. And there's there's you. a really good Brooklyn place in the city of Chicago now called Polly G's. So okay. it's a big place with a lot of different styles, a lot of different kinds of people. And so I'm just because yeah. the you know I if you if you go to a suburb, it's just it's going to be a little bit pl more plain in terms okay. of the, the food options. So again, gotcha. I'm, I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world. And so <laughs> I've got neighbors that I like, I meet in the alley, like we're doing a drug <laughs> deal or I'm selling them some sort of like hot merchandise. And it is technically hot merchandise. I'm just handing them a, you know, a, a pepperoni and spicy honey pie. <laughs> gotcha. So pizza. So then pizza is your thing. Is there, tell me something that I don't know mm. about, some type of food that I need to eat um, that I might not know about. Mm, okay. Well, where do you travel? I don't know Westchester uh, specifically. Every, well, you're, where do you're I travel? everywhere, I mean, right? Everywhere. Okay. Do you know what Bidia is? It's a kind of Bidia. taco. B-I-R-R-I-A. It's become very popular, but it's been around forever. Well, I'm okay. living in a cave, so okay. Uh, Bidia. Okay. Bidia. Bidia. So a Bidia uh, taco Bidia. is, it's basically slowly stewed beef um, in Ooh. a, uh, it, it's a broth of, it's a tomato based broth, but it also has, you know, hydrated chilies and onions and all the, so it's a slowly stewed beef broth. But the big thing is, if you get a queso Bidia, 
It's a cheese and that shredded beef. Ugh. But what they do, what they do, and here's the big difference maker, is they'll throw the cheese down on the griddle itself. And so you get this crispy cheese crispy. skirt within the taco. And Damn. then they give you a side of what they call the consomme, which is not truly like the French consomme. So you're dipping ah. your taco in its own <laughs> broth. And I'm telling you, you can do worse with a meal. Where have you been all my life? Dan <laughs> College football and food. Come on. I'm like, I'm a younger, more Jewish Todd Blackledge. How about that? <laughs> Spell that for me again. B-I-E-R-R-E. B-I-R-R-I-A. There is I R R I A. I -A. And okay, if, I got it now. That's just a tight it's a style of of beef preparation for tacos. Um and if you go if you ever find yourself in Brooklyn, if you ever find yourself in Queens, there's a truck. Yeah, I do. There's a truck. And now you're going to say a truck Dan I it was reviewed no, by the New York Times. I get it. It got two stars from the New York Times. Wow. Called Bedia Landia. So what I just spelled out for you L A N D I A. Um, I'm on it. I'll see you guys later. I'm heading out to Brooklyn. <laughs> Please go. There's one in Williamsburg and one in Jackson Heights. And it was it was just special. I brought my wife home the leftover consomme, the, the, the broth, and she went to town in about three seconds. So always looking out for people's stomachs. Yeah, yeah. Well good looking out. And well, how about how about desserts? Now what mm. what oh. what can you give us, I guess, um <laughs> I'm so you know, hungry. you're a bad man. One of your favorite desserts, and, and where do you get it from? Great question. Okay. I love blueberry. I, I I don't know what it is about me, but like a blueberry pie to me, or even, and I'll, I'll make this as well, and I'll give it to you with your pizza and, and the Chicago Burbs. I make a blueberry crisp or a blueberry crumble because I like the topping so much. I like a crusty, sweet topping so much. It's not a full cobbler because cobbler can be like more biscuit based. I was about to say, it sounds like something you put ice cream on top of though, you right? You can definitely put ice cream on top of this. My man, let's go. So I do I do let's that. Go. If I see yeah. a blueberry cobbler-ish dessert on a menu, I'm just doing it. It's one of those okay. things where I'm just, I, I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. I love I love donuts, great donuts, because we were talking about this before we started. Me at too. my At my wedding, my wife and I were talking while we were planning, and we said, I guess we got to get a cake or something like that. And I said, why? Why do we need to have a cake? Are you a cake person? Am I a cake person? And that conversation ended with us deciding on and executing a donut wall at our oh, wedding. Man. Oh, a I love donut it. wall. Love and it. so that's got, impressive. That is very impressive. We went all of our food at our wedding was handheld. We had setups, tacos, and you know, eggplant parm sliders, whatever. And then for we want people on the dance floor. We want people moving around. Everything handheld, and that included the donuts. So that's that's number yeah. two. Okay, I love donuts um, too. Certain the donuts, other thing, I'll also order um, if I see it on the menu on a dessert menu. If you're throwing a bread pudding at me, I'm gonna catch it. Like that to me, bread pudding, any sort of cobbler crisp. And um, like an old fashioned donut with like the sort of craggly surface yeah, I'm with. Yeah. Man, I got it. Listen, stuff, man. all of this, all this all okay day. for Desmond, who spends <laughs> half the day on his Peloton. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. The only, the only appropriate comparison here is I'm the Michelin Man. Okay, so <laughs> sure. I'm, just talking about this stuff, I gain weight. So <laughs> just I walk and th walk all day and think about what you want to eat. Actually. Here's the actual advice that I would give anybody. Only eat good, bad food. Don't eat bad, bad food, right? Don't waste your time eating fast food. Don't waste your time. Like if you if you go over to somebody's house and they pull a bunch of cookies out of like a supermarket container, yeah. do you really need those cookies? Or do you go to, or if, they, if they're bringing it in from like the best local bakery, or, like that's a big right. deal. Exactly. Yeah, listen, this is all great. We could talk college football and food all day. <laughs> The only thing I'm kind of bummed out about is that we didn't have time to talk about the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl or the Duke's Mayo Bowl. <laughs> oh, Sun Bowl is... might not be happening at the, at the time of recording this because Miami <laughs> couldn't play. Um, Please, the, it's the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl. Excuse me. Sun Bowl. The Tony okay. the Tiger and the coaches at the Mayo Bowl have both agreed to be doused with mayo. Oh, a, that's just gross, man. From a Gatorade jug <laughs> if they win. Which, look, I respect it. I respect that they're willing to give their all. If, it, it, if it's Mac Brown <laughs> and Shane Beamer at North Carolina and South Carolina, both. Yeah. And they're like, if it means we win, sure, whatever. 
that's a real thing. Just like the uh, the famous Idaho Potato Bowl douses the winning cool. coach in French yeah. fries, which yeah, is not a big cool. deal. Yeah, it's not bad. The no. Mayo, no. That's rough. <laughs> that's a rough look because you know that's going to be captured with professional cameras and yeah. blown up by somebody. Yep. That's a real yeah. thing. So I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but I was contacted by someone in uh, Ricky Williams' uh, camp, you know, a former uh, Heisman Trophy winner from Texas. No. And, and they, they talked about this new venture that, you know, because everyone's getting into, um, I guess it's medicinal marijuana. Sure. Yeah. And, and his is called Heis Man. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the Heis Man. Marijuana. Yeah. So, I, I you know, I, I thought about it. I, I considered it. Not sure if it was, um, you know, it, it it could be for the brand. It could not be for the brand. I'm not sure. sure. But what do you guys think about that? He, he has like this this uh, marijuana venture. And, and, and Ricky, you know, to his credit, has been um, a, a user for quite some time because yeah. using it for, I would say, uh, medicinal purposes. He had, mm -hmm. He's had anxiety and yeah. things like that, depression. So, I mean, he was, you know, not a casual user, but he had some real issues that marijuana helped him. Um, you know, deal with and mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Heisman brand of marijuana. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> Here's the first question. Okay, how are the? I want to know if the term Heisman is trademarked. First of all, right. Mm -hmm. And if it's trademarked, I, you know, that's a discussion that happens at a higher level. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. Oh, no. Couldn't resist that. You went there. Yeah. But I, I just, I, I'm just wondering how this plays at the downtown athletic club. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe they're planning not. their own strain. And so <laughs> that's that's where I'm going have. to the ceremony next year then. <laughs> going, yeah. You oh man. Uh yeah, I don't yeah. I, I assume like I don't know if they want to get involved in that. Like if he I, I uses a, the the hyphen in the right place. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think he, he's he, probably I I'm a, clearly an attorney here, a copyright attorney. <laughs> um I like it. I like the, it's a you great know, idea. You know, the highs man. Highs man. Highs man. Highs man. Yeah, as long. Yeah. As I'm just trying to think about the logo. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're holding out a leaf or something. Yeah, there'd be a leaf. <laughs> Maybe that's right. Maybe the leaf is on the end of the. <laughs> yeah, I, and he's. I don't know. You're holding like a hoagie or something in your hand or something. <laughs> I used to be involved with there. There was a trophy that used to be given out called the Piesman, which was awarded to the best large man play with the ball. So if a defensive lineman scoops and scores, we would give him an award called the Piesman, and the top of it was a slice, like a golden bronzed slice of pie. <laughs> wow. And so that was wow. fun. That was Pretty that cool. was a good twist that I don't yeah. think the Heisman committee had any issue with because <laughs> you're honoring large dudes making unorthodox plays with the football. All right. Well, listen, Dan Rubenstein, the host of Solid Verbal joins us today our final episode of the year of Hello Heisman. Dan, been great talking to you. Uh happy new year and uh enjoy the Duke's Mayo Bowl, I guess. Hey, <laughs> you guys as well. And uh, I don't know. Stay hydrated. Come visit and eat pizza. Yeah, definitely. Tell your wife I said go blue. I will yeah, absolutely do that. Yes, sir. <laughs>